in uh, the British colonial school system, um, abroad, not in Britain, but abroad, uh, children were taught to learn English by copying down a proverb or a wise saying that was printed at the top of their notebook or copy book. And uh, the poet and writer Rudyard Kipling, who spent most of his life in India, uh, he's known for writing The Jungle Book, you may have heard of it. Um, he wrote a, a sort of cautionary tale for society um, that uh, plays on this metaphor of the copybook heading. And uh, the poem is entitled The Gods of the Copybook Headings. And he distinguishes between this tried and true wisdom versus the gods of the marketplace, which represent what is popular or fashionable. So with that in mind, I'll let Kipling talk. As I pass through my incarnations, in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall. But the gods of the copybook headings, I notice, outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us, and they showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us, as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision and breadth of mind, so we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. We moved as the spirit listed, they never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne, like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field, or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world was built on, they were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that pigs had wings. So we followed the gods of the market who promised these wonderful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave up our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, stick to the devil, you know. In the first Fominian sandstones, we were promised the fuller life which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife. Till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith. And the gods of the copybook heading said, the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous epic, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. And though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy and the gods of the copybook heading said, if you don't work, you'll die. Then the gods of the market tumbled, and their smooth-tongued wizards withdrew, and the hearts of the meanest were humbled, and began to believe it was true, that all is not gold that glitters, and two and two make four. And the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man. There are only four things certain since social progress began. That the dog returns to its vomit, and the sow returns to her mire, and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And as soon as this is accomplished and the brave new world begins, when all men are paid for existing, and no man must pay for his sins, as surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter return. The startup world has been infected by the doctrine of the gods of the marketplace. Everybody is chasing unicorns. Now, we know from science that unicorns are mythical creatures. They don't actually exist. And the same is actually what's going on in the startup world. We have this perception that anybody 
can start this company that will eventually have a billion dollar valuation. You'll get bought by somebody in Silicon Valley. You'll get to move to San Francisco and have this wonderful life, and you'll be famous. Now, I'm. Uh, I'm a big fan of statistics. I think that if everybody learned how to use statistical reasoning, the world would be a much better place.、Uh, we, we wouldn't make nearly as many stupid decisions or have as many irrational fears as we do if we just applied a little bit of statistical reasoning. Now, when people get up and talk about unicorns, you know, the number of them in Israel or wherever, I, they say, "Oh, we've had this many," as if that's a big number. Compared to the total number of people failing. Now, if you think that you're exceptional to the statistics, then you might as well play the lottery. Like, it's a much lower risk、uh, kind of activity for bad statistical reasoning.、Uh, the lottery gives you roughly the same chance of getting rich as starting a startup. And these numbers are just going to get worse. And the reason for this is that. The funding environment we find ourselves in right now is unusual.、Uh, it's a little bit like the funding environment in the late 90s. It's a little bit like the funding environment in 2008. Well, 2007. Now, for some reason, Silicon Valley has become very good at getting people to like wipe their memories. Very like shockingly fast, do we forget what happened the last two times we tried this game? Very recently, too. You know, not like I'm not that old, and I remember both of them. So here we are playing the same game again. And let me tell you, this game is like a game of musical chairs where everybody's wearing a blindfold, and when the music stops, there's not one chair missing, but all the chairs will be missing. And so you have to think from your perspective: Do you want to be playing that game? Now, I don't want to play that game. It's not a fun game because it's not quite like musical chairs. Instead of your chair that's missing, it's your house, your car, your livelihood, and you have to start over from scratch with nothing. And everybody who you know probably doesn't like you because you lost their money or wasted their time, or you just failed and nobody wants to touch a failure. And you may think that there's this wonderful universe somewhere else in the world where people like failure. This is also a lie. I, I'm from the U.S. I spent most of my life there. I've spent the last eight years in South America, but I can tell you that this "oh, everything failure is okay in Silicon Valley" is nonsense. It depends on who you are, who you're connected to, and a lot of things that have nothing to do with your failure. So. If you want to be in this situation where, when the music stops, nobody wants to talk to you, go ahead, keep playing the game, go chase the funding. Because the thing is, once you take the first dollar of capital, your life is no longer your life. Your startup is no longer your startup. Now, until the day that you take somebody else's money, you're actually in control. It's your life, your startup. You can do anything you want. You don't want to grow fast. You don't have to grow fast. But the minute you take somebody else's money, money, the time starts ticking. Because the way this game works is, you take one dollar, and then you have to keep going and going and going. Because we operate on basically what I call the Roman startup model. You know, if you look at history, we have. Two of my favorite ancient civilizations: the Romans and the Egyptians. Now, I want to be like an Egyptian.、Uh, the Egyptians studied astronomy, built ships, and built things that would last for thousands of years.、Uh, they had a very slow growth approach to building civilization. The Romans, on the other hand, had the mentality of conquer as fast as you can and hope that the cost of conquest doesn't catch up with you. It did. By the way, and most startups find themselves with the cost of expansion eventually catching up with them. And then what happens? 
You can't raise any more money. You go broke. You expanded too quickly. You didn't build revenue. You may not have built a proper product, and then it's over. And you may say, "Okay, well then I just start again." How many of you have failed at a, a start? You raised money, failed. Hands in the air. Okay, and then started again immediately after. Okay, yeah, that's about right. You know, a third of those who fail immediately start again. You know, you have to be really stubborn to to make it in this world.、Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, it's not pleasant. It's not easy. It's much harder to start the second company than the first one because now everything you do feels like putting on wet socks. It just doesn't feel nice because you get these memories of all the bad things that happened the last time you did it, and that's why most people don't. So, people talk about failing fast. I think this is bullshit. What they should say is experiment. Measure the cost of your experiment, and run as many of them as you can, but avoid failure. Like failure where you run out of money and have to start over from scratch. Now, 100%. I have a little statistic for you. 100% of all startups that fail, fail for a single reason. They run out of money. That's why all startups fail. Now, the reasons they run out of money are many. But they fail because they run out of money. Because you no longer have time to keep going when you're out of money. So, if you have money, you shouldn't spend it. If you don't have money and you haven't raised it from investors yet, try to avoid that. And what I advocate, rather than approaching this sort of startup model, and, and let me tell you that it's not just going to get better. It's not like we're going to have another crash and then this funding environment will come back. It's not coming back this time. Three times institutional investors get burned. You're going to have to wait for a generational change. A whole bunch of them are going to die before insurance companies and pension funds start invest, investing in venture capital again. They literally will have to die. The boards of directors will have to die. The executives will have to die, and so that nobody remembers how bad it was. But this this particular crash is not going to be like the last two. It's not going to be sudden, because the whole nature of the financial ecosystem is a bit different. And there's a, a major reason for this, and it's called Sarbanes-Oxley. How many of you know about Sarbanes-Oxley? Okay, not enough of you. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley is a very obscure financial regulation that was passed in the U.S. in the last,、uh, well, after the Enron scandal. Sarbanes-Oxley has basically made it impossible for startups to do IPOs, and we right now are at a very, very low, like 2015, fewest IPOs since 2009. The IPO market is going down. So what this means is that there are fewer and fewer. Publicly traded companies with the capital to acquire startups, and there are fewer startups going public. So, those are the two ways that startups exit. Those are the only two: you get acquired, or you IPO. So, if both of those options are going away, what are startups supposed to do? If there isn't enough appetite in the market to buy your startup, and you can't raise any more money. You will die. This is very basic, and yet these things are completely ignored. So Sarbanes-Oxley has changed the fundamental nature of the business environment for startups, and you don't know about it because you don't think you, because Sarbanes-Oxley is about publicly traded companies in the U.S. Why should startups care about it? Well, because this is part of a whole food chain that you are part of. You are here. You, you do realize this, like. Startup entrepreneurs are the bottom of the food chain. You are what everybody else eats for lunch. The lawyers, the accountants, the auditors, the publicly traded companies, the angel inv—you、uh, you are their lunch, and they don't give a shit about you or your startup because most of them are playing the lottery. The lawyers, you pay them in cash.、Um, the the investors, they they don't they don't care about your particular startup. They care about one of their portfolio companies hitting the big money. They don't care if it's you. 
the advice they're giving you is to increase their odds that one of the members of their portfolio will hit it big, but not to increase your odds of hitting it big. If you're not looking out for yourself, nobody else will. This is a promise. And you're at the bottom of the food chain. They're trying to eat you. And the problem is that in, the, in this idea of the ecosystem, you do need apex predators in an ecosystem. If you don't have any apex predators, the whole thing collapses, right? If you've, I, it, you should go on YouTube and check out this video of what happened to Yellowstone National Park after they reintroduced wolves. It dramatically changed the whole nature and structure of the park. Like, forests revitalized, rivers were moved, like, really incredible video. Well, right now, we're at the literal verge of the almost extinction of the apex predators in the startup ecosystem. Because you basically have Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and, uh, like, I'm, I'm out. 30 years ago, there were a lot of these apex predators buying up startups and, and doing, like, the, the, the fundamental nature of the economy has changed because of regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley. So if there are fewer people buying you up, what do you do? So the alternative is to think about the transitional phase that we are in from the industrial economy to what I call the creative economy. Now, the creative economy doesn't have to do with like, being an artist or something like that. Not, not the term creativity as you're thinking about it. Rather, the creative economy is a world in which individuals have to find direct ways to create value for customers rather than being intermediated through a firm. So industrial capitalism created the firm. Um, in, in economic and legal theory, the firm has this sort of meaning. Um, now, we didn't need the firm before. Basically, um, the modern corporation in 17th century, roughly, like this very recent innovation, the corporation is. Because for, you know, humans have been around wandering the earth, not Homo sapiens, but predecessor species, since for about 300,000 years. For the vast majority of that time, like the first 290,000 years, uh, we were just hunting and gathering. And then we transitioned from the hunter-gatherer economy to the agricultural economy. And the agrarian economy meant people stayed in one place, planted crops, suddenly we had to pay attention to things like the seasons, and uh, we started observing the stars, and astronomy, astronomy is really critical to human civilization's progress, but that's another thing. But anyway, we had to have astronomy in order to do agriculture better. And then the agrarian economy goes along until the Industrial Revolution. Now, the first corporations were used to finance trading missions to the New World. Um, and then we get like the modern industrial corporation only in the last couple hundred years. So the job, like what you think of as a job where some organization pays you a salary, this is really, really new. Hum most humans that have ever lived didn't have anything that resembled a job. Nothing. It's a bizarre concept. The only jobs that existed prior to the Industrial Revolution were government jobs. That's it. Otherwise, you either grew food or you had a trade. You were a blacksmith or, or whatever. And there was no, no such thing as companies that employed people. So, because in your whole life, and your parents' whole life, and your grandparents' whole life, everybody had jobs, you think that jobs are normal. But jobs are really abnormal. It's unusual. Now, I like to tell people that like, our educational system is more or less structured as prison training. Um, you're told what to do, where to be, and what the metrics are for good behavior, and if you do all of those, then when you graduate, you, you get lucky and get to go to a minimum security prison, which is a job. And the only distinction between the minimum security and maximum security prison uh, is that the minimum security prison lets you go home at the end of the day. Right? That's about it. So this job apocalypse is great news. This venture capital apocalypse is also great news because it means you actually have the opportunity now to take control of your own life 
and not have it dictated by an employer or investors. I, for one, would rather be able to choose the way I structure and organize my day and not have to worry that, well, at some moment, I might get a phone call from an investor telling me I have to be at their office or that I have to change my strategy because they don't think that what I'm doing is going to work. But we aren't really prepared for this creative economy thing, like taking responsibility for our own actions. No, like, we can't have that. Please no, right? Everybody is kind of terrified of actually being responsible for their own life because then when things don't go well, you have nobody to blame but yourself. So this is why we all run away from responsibility as fast as we can. We love to blame everybody else for our problems. We love to say, oh, I would be so successful, but the government, you know, they just, too much regulation, taxes are too high, so it's the government's fault that I'm a failure and a loser. Or, well, I just can't get that promotion because my boss is a real jerk. Oh, you know, and insert all the excuses that you have in your life for being, you know, mediocre, because by definition, everybody is, the vast majority of people are just mediocre, right? Bell curve, middle, that's most people. So you're mediocre because you choose to be mediocre. And you could choose not to be. Uh, but it means taking serious responsibility for the structure of your own life. So in the creative economy, it means you have to have a personal strategy. And I suggest, uh, adopting Nassim Taleb's barbell strategy. If you've read, anybody have read Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb? Okay, all of you should read this book. It's worth reading. Um, because the barbell strategy is, is the, the, the best way to achieve my guaranteed formula for success. It works every time. It is survival plus luck. This is the guaranteed way to be successful in life. Because the longer you survive, the, longer the more chances you have to get lucky. And most people with lots of money, they got lucky. And then they passed it off as talent. Because that's the way people are. Like, this is one of our great cognitive biases, is that we see somebody who has something, and we assume they must have gotten it because they're better than we are, or they're smarter, or whatever. Well, most of the time, it's just because they got lucky. I mean, why, why does Uber come on stage instead of Lyft? Well, it's, you know, kind of market luck. Same product, one wins, one loses. You know, it's not necessarily, like, if you look at the, the old battles between HD DVD and Blu-ray or VHS and Betamax, it has nothing to do with who had the better technology. Apple and Microsoft in the early days. Steve Jobs' technology was much better. But, like, talent, is not enough. You have to get lucky. Now, if you are dead and out of the market, you have no chances of getting lucky. Zero. I like to play poker. And something I've learned from poker is that if I'm playing a hand of poker and I bet a lot of chips early on, then I have fewer chips to bet later when I really need them. And I also find, you know, people who bet everything early on in the game and lose, well, they're out. So it, all of the possible hands they could have dealt in the future, they don't even get to see. I mean, how many of you have ever played a game of poker where, like, the hand ends and you say, but I want to see what card I would have gotten? Yeah, like, this is a, yeah, but it doesn't matter because you didn't get there. The hand ended. So in the creative economy, you want to make sure that you don't play all of your chips until you're ready to be done playing which, you know, hopefully should be like in your 80s and you're, you know, about done. But this is a totally different kind of strategy than we're used to playing. We're used to playing the play it, you know, moderately safe, get a good paying job from a company whose finances we don't understand, so we don't know actually how at risk they are of going bankrupt. I mean, that's most people's model of getting a job. I mean, how, how many of you know the financial, you've reviewed the financial health of your employer, those of you who have a job. You actually read their, ooh, this is a lot of people, I'm, I'm shocked. How many of you know what their off-balance sheet transactions are? Oh, 
You must be an accountant. <laughs> I can spot you. Uh, so very few people really do this. Uh, and the reason is that we don't want to know. It's just, just like why you don't open that credit card statement the minute you get it in the mail. You're like, oh, I'll, I'll look at that a little bit later. Because we don't really like to embrace the reality of our risks. Now, in a world where automation is, uh, is increasingly creating revolutions in industries that people didn't think could be automated, I mean, medicine, we're about to have no, do no need for doctors anymore. Right? That's one of the, the most critical things happening in AI right now is like, the elimination of the need for doctors. Um, so you may find yourself one day working in a job that gets completely cut by market forces. And then what do you do? How do you survive? Yes, you could go protest on the streets, and that will feed you exactly zero days. Protesting is shockingly not good for the, you know, filling your stomach. Uh, it may bring you some sort of emotional satisfaction, but it doesn't put food on the table. If there are any. I mean, I don't know exactly what the situation is here, but you know, go to Italy. They've been structurally with one of the highest unemployment rates in their history for a decade. You know, Spain has 60% youth unemployment. That's the future of everywhere, if you don't create your future. So the barbell strategy goes like this. You invest 80, 90% of your resources in something that is really safe and guarantees that you can eat. And then you invest another, the other 10 to 20% in something that might have the possibility of getting lucky and having a huge exponential payoff. So the alternative to the unicorn startup model, the Roman startup model, chase a lot of investment money as fast as you can and hope that you get big enough that somebody buys you before the, the chickens come home to roost. The alternative is find a way to provide value to somebody, and preferably a couple of somebody, so you're not reliant on one. Provide that value day after day after day, even though it's boring even though you know, your mother doesn't really want to brag about it to her friends. You do that day in and day out, and with discipline, continue to invest in the long shots that probably won't ever pay you anything, but you know that you can keep eating. Then you might actually have the possibility of a breakout startup. But it's a very conservative approach, and people at conferences don't like conservative things. They want to talk about how everything is changing and, and all the rules are going to be different. So I've given you the strategy for the creative economy, and I'm going to give you the three important skills that you need to survive in the creative economy. The first one is lifelong learning and reinvention. You must have an identity that can be changed at any minute. You know, you walk up to people, you say, hi, you know, hi I'm Skinner, and then I'm A, and you insert something. Well, most people have a relatively fixed definition of what that I am this, you know. You hear, I'm an engineer, or I am, you know. Well, you need to have a much more malleable identity. You may be really proud of whatever you are right now, but that may not be useful to you in the future. So you have to be willing to be other things. In fact, you should almost just be nothing. Like, you should just be you and not something. I mean, you is actually way more complex and, and beautiful and wonderful than being an engineer, right? I mean, each of us has inside of our head a pretty expansive consciousness that we don't even understand ourselves, much less anybody else. And that's, that's actually more interesting than being an engineer. But you have to be willing to reinvent that identity over and over and over and to keep learning new things over and over and over because in fact, you should probably learn some skills that you don't think you'll ever use, just in case the skill that you're using the most gets automated. Because it will also happen suddenly. All this, uh, like, these disruptions are happening by surprise. You usually can't predict them. So the more skills you acquire, 
Also, I think the happier life you will lead. Because when you're learning, well, ha- um, somebody earlier mentioned, uh, somebody else on stage mentioned Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, those of you who know about it, the system one, system two thinking, where system one is our fast brain and system two is our slow brain. Well, one of the things that I, I have noticed is that when we are in system two, our slow, rational brain, where we're concentrating on something, time passes more slowly. Have you ever had the experience, for example, of walking to or driving to a new restaurant that you've never been before, and then on the way back home, you say, oh, well, that wasn't as far as it seemed. You ever had this experience? Like, you go to a new place, you have this, like, it seems like a really long time to get there, and then no time to get back. Well, that's because when you're familiar with something, you're in system one, and when you're unfamiliar with it, you're in system two. You're, like, concentrating, paying attention. So one of the things I've noticed is that time stretches out when we're in system two. And this is really fantastic news, because in a world where you are constantly learning new things, you're sort of always in system two which means, in a sense, you get more out of your life. You get more time. Not more mechanical time, not more days, but it seems like you lived more. So this is good. It also means that you will discover things about yourself going through life that you wouldn't have discovered if you weren't learning those things. Because anytime you do something new, you have an opportunity to learn something about yourself that you didn't know. It's not a one-way flow of information. Learning about a subject matter is you interacting with the subject matter and creating a feedback loop. The subject tells you something, and in a sense, you tell the subject something. And you observe what you're communicating back. So you get to discover more things about yourself. Maybe you figure out that you can do a lot of things that you didn't think you could do, and that you liked doing things that you thought you would hate. Have you ever had that experience? Like, You dreaded doing something because you thought, I'm going to hate this. And then you did it, and you said, well, actually, I kind of like it. That's a wonderful discovery, right? Those are some of the best surprises in life. So in the creative economy, you get to do that all the time. It's actually your job to keep learning. And going to school, to a formal degree program, Spending a lot of money, that doesn't seem like a very good way to do lifelong learning, because you have to keep doing it. So if you have to rely on a classroom that you're paying somebody to teach you, this is going to get really expensive. Now, fortunately, hundreds of thousands of people over the last 100 years dedicated their lives to very boring work that produced the internet. And I assure you that it was mostly boring work. Like, the creation of the internet was a lot of nerds doing very boring work and never being recognized for it. And you take this for granted. I mean, the fact that we carry around computers in our pockets that have more computing power than the first mission to the moon, this is a remarkable fact. But what's perhaps even more remarkable is the reality that if you had been born 500 years ago, and you put, put on stage, like if I took somebody born 500 years ago, put them on stage, and said, here, and I handed my phone, I said, push this button, and you will get to listen to music. They would probably cry. The idea of being able to produce music on demand would have been considered a precious treasure at any other time in history. And we just sort of treat it like, norm- like it's this normal, everyday, common thing. It's actually really incredible. And so lots and lots of people gave their whole lives to making this possible for us, and today, you can now go online and learn literally anything about anything. All the way up to nuclear physics, if you want. For free. I mean, you have to have a device, $150 for a you know, decent little tablet, and an internet connection. And you can learn anything for free. Nobody has had that ability in human history. So there are some things that are pretty different. That means you have fewer excuses, though. Sorry to tell you. Like, you're sitting there, all that list of uh, the excuses of why you have a mediocre life, well, it gets shorter and shorter as technology continues to advance. 
And so this means you are increasingly responsible for whatever your state of affairs is. Regardless of where you were born or what circumstances you were born to, today, more than any other time in all of history, you can get out of them. But you have to be willing to learn and to keep learning and to keep challenging yourself to do things that are difficult and not fun. I mean, nobody really wants to sit down, I mean, a few people, but nobody really wants to sit down and learn advanced mathematics in their room alone. But you could, you think you can't, because school poisoned you with this idea that you're bad at math. Uh, and, and they teach you this because you weren't fast at math. This is really unfortunate. Like, most of us are capable of doing pretty advanced mathematics, but we are poisoned against it by school. But you could correct this. You could sit down at your tablet and learn, to learn advanced mathematics. And then, you know, when the guys get up on stage, you know, the engineers from Tesla and the AI guys, like, you could understand everything they're saying. That's up to you. You can't say, oh, well, I'm just not a technical person. This is not a valid excuse anymore. You can say, I've chosen not to understand these things. Now, the second skill that you have to learn in the creative economy that's even more important than it's ever been is how to build relationships with people. This means actually caring about people and communicating with them, not just picking up business cards at a networking event. This means understanding why people are the way they are, understanding why you are the way that you are. You know, why is it that when you meet a certain kind of person, you have this like painful, miserable reaction to them? Well, you probably should figure that out, because chances are you'll need those people. Like, you actually have to work with them. You can't just do business and work with people that are just like you. And so this is the thing, like this relationship building has to be horizontal and not vertical. In the industrial economy, relationships should be vertical. You wanted to network with people and build relationships with people who did the same thing you do, because that's how you move up, right? But there's no up in the creative economy. It's sideways. So you're trying to create value for somebody who needs what you do. Well, the chances are that they're somebody like you is zero, because if they're like you, they can do what you do. They don't need you. So that means that if you are an artistic person, you have to learn how to talk to the computer folks. And if you're you know, a computer science guy, you have to learn to talk to people, just generally. <laughs> There's this old joke about uh, how can you tell if you have an extroverted computer programmer? He stares at your shoes. Uh, you'll get it in a minute. Uh, so you have to actually get out there and meet people. Now, fortunately, the internet connects you to basically all the people. Not quite, but we're getting there really fast. Um, so that also the chances are that the people who need what you do the most don't live in your city or your country or your continent. And today, you can take their money without ever meeting them in person. This is really fantastic as well. You have, so you should never, I, I, I almost go crazy at these kind of events when I hear people talking about national startup policies and this country and that, this is just medieval thinking, okay? Like, there, con, the idea of the country is just this arbitrary thing that we'll probably keep for a, long, a lot longer than we need to just because old habits die hard, right? Um, but thinking, but don't like, you can just accept that that's not going to change, but don't let your mind be infected by this stupidity. Like, understand that you speak, all of you, I assume, speak English, or you would be, like, already out of the room. Um, so, English and code, these are the two languages you need to know. If you speak English and code, then you can make a lot of money in the creative economy. If you can only speak English, you're, you'll do okay. If you can only speak code, as long as you can speak to somebody who speaks English, you'll do okay too. But if you can speak both, you're going to be in really great shape. Because most of the market that isn't here in Lithuania that you're going to sell to speaks English. And so you should be teaching English to your children too, like from, from here. And probably also code. And this is the way that you prepare young people for the creative economy, but it's no different for you. It's just harder for you because your brain is less plastic. 
So it takes a little bit more effort to get the gears moving. But you can do it, anybody, any age. There's really, there's a lot of research that shows that as soon as you start learning something, your brain improves its plasticity. We used to think that this was not possible, that after a certain age, there was no way to change brain plasticity, but this is now being disproven by neuroscience. So, again, no excuses. So you have to meet people from everywhere, doing every kind of thing, in different age brackets, people who don't look like you, people who listen to strange music compared to you, because anything that isn't what you like is strange. I mean, this is the way we are. Um, people who dress strangely or whatever, like, you've got to learn how to accept, tolerate, and get on with a whole bunch of different people. This is not very customary in most of history. I'll, for the last eight years, I've been living in South America, and I, it's very funny because when I'm traveling to Europe or whatever, and people apologize for their English, and I, 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 I actually forget that this language barrier is a thing, because I'm so used to having language barrier that it's become normal to my life. Like, for eight years, I've either communicated not in my native language or in, like, with somebody who wasn't speaking my native language. And so, this became normal. If this isn't normal for you yet, you should make it normal really fast, because that will make you much more marketable to the people over the world. Now, the third skill, and this is the most depressing of all of them, sorry, is accounting. And I mean literal inflow, outflow kind of accounting, as well as several layers of metaphor accounting as well. So here's the thing about accounting. You can't outsource it. I will repeat this. You cannot outsource accounting. If you don't know how to do your own accounting, you are basically playing Russian roulette with your finances. Because nobody knows your business and your financial life like you. You can give them a bunch of paper receipts, but they don't know what any of that means. And accounting isn't just the numbers on your receipts. The accounting is this deep understanding of the oxygen in the blood flowing in and out of your heart. And nobody likes accounting other than accountants because it's kind of boring to everybody but accountants. It, well, if you don't learn how to make it not boring for you, then you will for sure run out of money. Now, I'm going to use a metaphor that is not very pleasant, but it will stick with you. Uh, and the first rule of public speaking is be remembered. So, accounting is like urination. Okay? If you're lying in bed in the morning, maybe you drank too much the night before, you're a little hungover, and you know you have to pee. You, can't, you know you can't get anybody else to do it for you, right? We're all on the same page on that. You can't outsource that. Uh, and if you stay there long enough not doing it, you will have a massive mess to clean up later, right? You will basically wake up in a bed full of piss. Okay? Accounting is exactly like this. If you put it off, you will wake up in a miserable, disgusting mess that will take years, often, of your life. So you have to do it. And you have to do it down to the penny, and you have to care about the pennies. And the reason for this is that they tend to go very quickly. And it's the little expenses that sink great enterprises. It's not the big expenses. And so if you don't have an intimate knowledge of every penny coming in and out of your financial life, and why it's going out, and why the pennies are coming in, and from whom, and why, and their accounting, as much as you can get out of it, then at some point you'll get surprised and run out of money. That's the way it works. I know this sounds like you're saying, oh, this is horrible. Well, yes. I mean, I, I, one of the things I, I like to ask venture capitalists is, so, like, what do, what do you do about accounting with early-stage companies? And they say, oh, well, we, they don't really need so much accounting. Oh, really? Okay. Definitely wouldn't put money with you, and I certainly wouldn't want to reinvest in your startups then. Accounting is something we should teach children. Because it's life. Money is life. If you don't have money, you can't eat. You die, right? This is pretty simple. Well, accounting is how you know that you have enough money to buy food. 
So if you don't grow a garden, you need to be really great at accounting. Now, I take this accounting thing really seriously at another le level up, and um, because I want to account for everything. I want to account not only for my money, but also my time, but more importantly, my energy. Because my energy is the most valuable resource I have. I can have time, but if I have no energy, I accomplish nothing, right? So what are the things that, get, that take our energy? Well, we have our physical health. If we eat badly, we don't sleep, we drink too much alcohol, these kind of things take our energy, don't they? Yeah. I, the, the room this morning at 9 o'clock was pretty empty, and I think it had something to do with alcohol uh, and sleep, just a guess. Um, but my energy is what allows me to do anything that I'm going to do. So I can account for my physical health, what I'm eating, how it makes me feel, and also my emotional health, because my emotions often make me unproductive or productive. I, have you ever had this? Like, you're just in a bad mood and you get nothing done. Have any of you ever experienced this? Okay, yes, everybody. How many of you experience it more than one time per week? Come on, don't lie. Um, so this is my accounting ledger for my mental and emotional accounting. And every day, not every single day, but almost every day, I get up and I write, sometimes for 20 minutes, sometimes for two hours. Depends on how much I need to get out. Understanding every single conceivable thought that may come up to bother me that day. Anything. Had a bad date two days ago, still thinking about it, it goes here, right? Anything that's occupying space that should be occupied by what I want to get accomplished, it goes here. And sometimes it's pages and pages and pages. And what I found is that there are patterns, just like in accounting records. You know, you notice that you spent $500 last month on paper clips. You say, wait a minute, why did I spend $500 on paper clips? Well, the same thing with your emotions. You discover, wait a minute, I spent like half of my energy last month on this one emotion from the same cause. Something's got to change here. And remarkably, when you start recognizing these patterns and putting them in ink, and putting your thoughts in ink, some of the thoughts that cause you a lot of problems up here, when you see them in ink, you're like, that's really stupid. Why was I spending so much time worrying about that? It doesn't make any sense. So you have to account for everything. Everything that you have a limited supply of, you should account for. That's how you preserve it, and that's how you get more. If you don't know that you have a shortage of it, you don't know that you need to do some effort to get more of it, right? And if you see it going out really fast in one area, you need to stop that somehow. So this accounting thing really matters, and it matters at every layer that you can imagine. Our bodies are great accountants. You know this, right? You know this urination thing? I was like, that's accounting. Like, you took in too much water, now you need to get rid of it. Your, your cells, each of your cells, and there are lots of them, every minute are exchanging energy in order to survive, and all of this is basically accounting. So, like, we are natural accountants. Life is natural accounting. The reason that we have organic material, not inorganic material, organic material is way better at accounting than inorganic material. And so this is why we do all the things we do. All of evolution is driven by just better accounting. So if you want to improve your own life's evolution within your one lifetime, you have to be a better accountant. So since I've kind of rained on your parade today, I want to leave you with some hope, because it actually is a wonderful time to be alive. As I said, we can do so many things that we could never do before. Uh, and we have the opportunity to meet people that it would be inconceivable 50 years ago that, any of, like, that I would have met any of you. Completely inconceivable 50 years ago. There's no chance. I was born on a farm in Arkansas. I bet none of you have been. Anybody been to Arkansas? Wow. Where? Okay, yeah, there's a lot to see there, you know. 
Um, it's really inconceivable we would have met 50 years ago. So that's really incredible to me. We have technologies that are making all of our lives so much easier. You know, we have dentistry. Next time you get a toothache, you, you forget about some golden age theory of the past because you're like, oh, I'm really glad I have painkillers for that toothache. So it's a great time to be alive, and you have great opportunities for your life. So I want to leave you with a few words, a few words from Ralph Waldo Emerson and a few words from Kipling again. Emerson says that basically the antidote to all of your problems in life is self-trust. He says, trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort and advancing on chaos and the dark. And we find ourselves today surrounded by chaos, everything that we, all these assumptions we have about life, the world, politics, religion, everything is changing really fast, right? Every time we open the newspaper, some new disturbance is happening somewhere in the world. There's a lot of chaos. All these new technologies, what's going to happen to the human race, you know, synthetic biology, all sorts of things happening. But you can put yourself in the middle of these events. You just have to choose to be courageous about it to say, I'm not going to run away from it. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and pretend like it's not happening. I'm not going to sit around drinking beer and complaining that I was dealt a bad hand in life. But putting yourself out there, taking risks, being willing to have everybody look at you and say, you're crazy. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Emerson says that whoso would be a conformist must learn to estimate a sour face. And he describes, you know, in polite company, meeting people when you're supposed to put on airs, you know, he, he says, the muscles in the mouth, not, not spontaneously moved, but gripped by a low usurping willfulness. You know, conferences are a great place for this low usurping willfulness. Somebody comes up to talk to you, and they're completely boring, but you're like, oh yes, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. No, no, if you really want to put yourself out there in the middle of the world and be remembered and do something that matters, you have to be willing for everybody to say, you're crazy. And we, we have these startup conferences basically because in the rest of the world we're told we're crazy. So we come here for everybody to pat each other on the back. Oh, this is the opposite of what will lead to innovation. Like, we need to come here and like shout at each other and like be really angry and say, no, 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 you're wrong because this and this and that, and that actually, you know, get something done, make some progress. So you have to be willing to do that, to put yourself out there in the middle of it. But this life of responsibility and risk-taking, this balance between the two, this is where all meaning is created. Because meaning is created when we solve problems. Solving problems means friction with reality, right? No problem just solves itself. It's friction with reality. And that friction has to be both bold and responsible. It's easy to be one or the other. It's very hard to be both. And so on this subject of balance, I will leave, leave you with the words of Kipling once again. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, nor being lied about, don't deal in lies, nor being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, 
twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or see the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue and walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the world and all that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Thank you all so much. <laughs>